Hello again, and thanks for joining us for the Brockton Bay Chronicles. My name's Keith. Here with me, as always, is my good buddy and first-time worm reader, Andy. Are you uh, ready to clean up the carnage left by uh, mannequins, sir? Goodness, I guess so. Uh, yeah, this is going to be a wild ride for this episode. What we're going to be covering is reviewing Arc 12 Plague, chapters 6 through 8, and the interludes. And as far as new business, uh, we've got a number of questions and comments from YouTube. We certainly do. And let's start off with this first question from Johannes Ijoson. Uh, please forgive me. I hope I, I said your last name correctly. And the question and comment is, in the summary episode, Andy mentioned reading Pact as a way to ease the itch of wanting to read ahead. And Keith said he was reluctant to read it. I had thought about this. What if, as a future project, you reverse the dynamic you have going here on the Worm Podcast, with Keith reading Pack for the first time, and Andy being the sage mentor type guiding him through this world? Well, Johannes, this is a very interesting idea. Uh, I am a little hesitant, um, primarily because I'm not sure I can offer the kind of insights my good buddy Andy is. Uh, Andy does here in our little uh, worm project. Through the uh, the history of our of our 30 plus year friendship, I've always had a, a, a healthy respect and appreciation for Andy's big brain. And uh, when we discuss various science fiction or fantasy movies or books, um, I, I regularly rely on and and look forward to getting his inputs on things. So, I, I, you know, this may be unlikely, but never say never. What do you think, Andy? What do, what do you think? I'm not sure I could bring your, your wit and wisdom to, uh, to pact, but uh, what do you think of the idea? Well, I think you're selling yourself a little bit short there. Uh, I think you've had a lot of practice in uh, developing your insight, if you will, by trying to figure out ways to guide me through this and, uh, you know, prompt me to uh, think about things and summarize things. So I think, uh, I think you'd be doing fine on that side of things. I think it'd be fun to turn the tables a little bit. Um, and I also greatly appreciate you using 30 plus rather than probably much closer to the next decade <laughs> and letting everybody really know how old we are. So. Yeah. Well, who knows? Um, we're, we're barely a third of the way into this thing. So who knows what the future holds? So thanks for the suggestion, Johannes. We'll, we'll see what happens. Our next question from YouTube comes from reader. The last few arcs showed Taylor more and more what her power is capable of and where her limits are not. What do you think of the powers, their origins, their limits at this stage of the story? It's an interesting question. I, I'm still not sure. I, I guess my feeling is that there is some extraterrestrial beyond human understanding power that is somehow experimenting with our world and providing insights, in, inventiveness, planting ideas that are allowing powers to be created or uh, allowing different people to have trigger events. If, if there is some intelligence behind all of this, then they'd want to have like checks and balances. They wouldn't want things to get out of control. So uh, one thing that always kind of creeps me out is how, how far outnumbered we are as mammals compared to the insect world. <laughs> and so you wouldn't want, Taylor to be able to like control all the bugs. <laughs> um, that'd be like worse than a zombie movie. That'd just be, you know, all right, goodbye. <laughs> and so uh, I think there's got to be some limits to it. If there is this something happening like that, some kind of uh, wizards of Oz behind the curtain, pulling the strings here to mix metaphors, but I'm not sure what those limits are uh, as, as, reader points out uh, they keep expanding so we don't know 
I would think at some point it would get to where she couldn't manage all the data coming in. And But then who knows? Maybe she'd get to the point where she could like boost one of the bugs to be an intermediary network node that would be a lieutenant controlling some other giant segment of the swarm or something. I don't know. So anything could happen. Interesting supposition. <laughs> Next question is from Valley. I hope that's a correct pronunciation. Jack of Shadows is such an excellent book. It was cool to hear it mentioned. Zelazny was one of those rare authors who, as soon as I discovered them, I had to read everything they wrote. The Amber series is still an all-time favorite of mine. One cool thing about Arc 11A through 11H, Wild Bo wrote a chapter a day. Check the dates on the main. Uh, check the dates on each on the main reading URL. This was approximately a short novel written in a week. I love this section. Also, you get so much depth in so many characters, and I would agree with that. I think we commented on it. Um, I believe I said I felt that Wild Bo really seemed to find his stride uh, when de- describing how much I enjoyed mm. those those interludes. Uh, what do you think, Andy? Well, there's a lot to unpack here. Zelazny is by far one of my favorite authors. Uh, I might say my my favorite sci-fi fantasy author. After reading Lord of Light, which is another one of his big books, and seeing that it had won the two big sci-fi awards, the Hugo and the Nebula, mm-hmm. uh, I made it a point to try to find what other few books had done that. And uh, they were all excellent. So it was a neat way to kind of find new authors. But yeah, Zelazny is amazing. Roadmarks is another one of my favorites of his, which is a very bizarre book in that it's got chapter one and then chapter two and then chapter one and then chapter two. And after a while, you realize it's basically two parallel stories that he's, you know, it's just story one and story two that he's leaving. And you wonder if they're going to come together or not, but it takes a long time. And it was just a neat literary vehicle that he used there. What's the name of that again? Road Marks. Okay. It's it's really cool. I can still picture the cover on it. And it's short, so mm-hmm. it's, it's a neat book to get into. But yeah, Wild Bow and Eleven, I, it seemed like he got into what they call the flow, you know, where he just, and it's neat. I mean, we all experience it in rare occasions, some people more than others, but when you just get in that mode and and things get rolling Mm -hmm. and you're really just living in it and next thing you know five hours has gone by it's dark outside you're really hungry your eyes are scratchy because you haven't blinked very much and it's neat to be in that and and it really comes through in that section there and i agree he was really hitting his stride next question we have from uh, another uh, input from from reader what is your opinion on Wild Bow's style and worm concerning cliffhangers, which work differently in serial reading than when binging the whole work? If I recall correctly, Cliffhanger comes from one of the early serials, which was Sherlock Holmes by Arthur Conan Doyle. Holmes was fighting uh, his main adversary and had gone over Kill Devil Falls and Moriarty had looked like had killed Holmes and Holmes was left hanging on a cliff and that was the end of that installment and people had to wait uh, until the next time it was printed and when the next story came out it just said after his return from the falls Holmes <laughs> and it just <laughs> went on like you with no explanation everybody's like wait a minute he was dead, right? So the idea of cliffhanger has been around a long time. I like mm-hmm. the way Wild Bo uses it. I think he does a great job with it. He he softens the blow. There's some that are just jarring. I was watching a, a show that I've liked actually more than I expected called, I think, Anchorage Daily from ABC. Mm-hmm. And the episode that just finished was on a, a huge cliffhanger. And I was just like, oh, my gosh, that's that's where they're at. Oh, no, what the heck? I can't <laughs> wait. What's going to happen? So Wild Bow softens those, and they're they're there, but they're not like you're just you know gripping your 
edge of your chair for a week trying to, you know, wait to see the next thing. So I think he he strikes a good balance with it. All right. All right. And our final question comes from regular contributor Megafire7. Glad you're enjoying the darker turn as well. I think the mannequin fight is this arc. So with that in mind, what do you think of how Skitter's territory sees their resident supervillain? Well, I try to put myself in the mindset of the people in Brockton Bay and specifically people who are really hammered by all this. I would think they would just be so skittish and so sure that, you know, something bad was going to happen every day that having a supervillain would be kind of a negative, but it's just like, Oh, it's just another crappy day in Brockton Bay. So, uh, being in, in Skidder's territory, I don't think was a huge shock to most people, but I think after the fight, they realized that, well, maybe this is actually not a bad thing. And just to get it out of the way, I was, I was shocked at the whole way that this went. I mean, it makes sense when you think of the whole philosophy of, uh, the slaughterhouse nine, but I figured after the Shatterbird thing that, you know, they would find some other where place to play and and ply their trade in the neighboring areas. You know, oh, hey, look, this neighborhood didn't get affected by the Endbringers at all. Let's mess them up for a while. But instead, they just, you know, doubled down. And then yeah. they're like, oh, there's a bunch of people hurt by this. No, don't try to help them. Let them suffer. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah. Gru touches on it later in the arc where he says, you remember the probabilities, right? And so for Wild Boat to just throw out those probabilities in one chapter and then the next chapter say, let's put those probabilities to the test. <laughs> that was kind of like, oh, well, this, uh, w- I wonder what's going to happen here. Are they going to clone <laughs> her from her remains or <laughs> what's going to happen here? Is Panacea going to be able to restore her from a fingernail? I don't know. Right. So. Well, let's so, dig in. Uh, yeah, save some of the, save some of that uh, insight for. Um, okay, we dig into that section of the of the arc. So, and with that, thanks very much, folks, for the uh, contributions as always. And we will move on to our review at this point. And we're starting off arc twelve, chapter six, and we have Skitter heading back to her territory. And she's passing num- a number of folks who are injured severely and uh, trying to come to terms with the, the, the sand burn and the, the shards the, uh, the, of glass. It's really, uh, again, once again, Brockton Bay is, is a war zone at the hands of some malev- ma- malevolent <laughs> Say that three times fast. Uh, outside force <laughs> that's re- wreaked havoc on on the town, and um, Skitter's heading to her area at Coyle's behest to t- try to deal with the situation. Thoughts on how she handled that thing um, prior to Mannequin showing up uh, or getting things organized? And as a teenage girl, how do you f- feel she uh, handled that whole situation? Surprisingly well. It doesn't come up until later in the arc. But the fact that everything with silicon and glass is now rendered useless or destroyed, you don't think about the impact that that has and how how messed up that would be. You know, they they talk about in a lot of sci-fi stuff like EMP, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Electromagnetic pulse and how that would knock out all the cars. And so you should have you know, a pre-1974 car that doesn't have any computer chips in it in case of a zombie apocalypse or whatever. (laughs) And so, you know, it's like, oh, well, she could call. Oh, no, she can't do that. Oh, well, she could look it up on her computer. Oh, no, she couldn't do that. Oh, and and it's just one thing after another. All the tools that we rely on in our society are all gone. So she's having to really come up with innovative ways at the same time trying to totally put aside how her dad is doing and how Tattletail is doing. And 
she stumbles a little bit at times, uh, which is totally understandable for a teenage girl. I doubt I would I would do any better. Uh, the whole idea of you know you don't ask people, you have to order people to kind of snap them out of their shock and to show them that at least on the surface, it looks like somebody knows what they're doing and they're in charge. So I will just follow orders because I can't think straight, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, Charlotte steps in and helps out with, with making that work after uh, Skitter's kind of beating herself up about screwing up with it. Yeah. I was uh, about she to handles the about to say she got a nice assist from Charlotte in that moment. For sure. Yeah. That, that saved the day there. Uh, she deals with the same old angry dude again, the ungrateful guy that, yeah. you know, from getting rid of the rats. And then she deals with the kind of know-it-all clinic lady, uh, <laughs> you know, and it's just like, seriously, you know, I mean, hydrogen peroxide might not be all that that we thought it was when we were kids and our moms gave it to us for everything mm -hmm. up to the plague. <laughs> But you know what? It's better than rubbing dirt on it. So <laughs> just as we used to say, have a Coke and a smile, sit down and shut up and do what I told you. Exactly. Know? And so <laughs> it's just like one thing after another. I would have been just, you know, putting tarantulas on people and stuff. Look, do you want to get rid of the tarantula? Do what I asked you to do. It, yeah. she. It seemed like for a moment she was... <laughs> I mean, as she was weighing her options, having having fumbled that initial, hey, please help kind of thing, as opposed to, as you pointed out correctly, directing people, for a moment, she kind of was like, oh, well, maybe I got to be, you know, have the spiders, threaten them with spider <laughs> bites. Um, right. And that's when Charlotte showed up and gave her the assist. Yeah. And so then things are looking, they're looking up, you know, she's realizing that there's definite limitations on resources, but people are moving, people are assisting each other. Even the, the grumblers seem to be kind of doing what they're supposed to do. Uh, the paramedics aren't totally backing her up and, and following the party line, but at least they're not blurting out, Hey, that's wrong. So, uh, you know, it could, it could be a lot worse. And then all of a sudden it gets way worse. <laughs> Oh, geez. Yeah. Yeah. Before we get to that, uh, what did you think of her use of her bugs to fetch her supplies? Um, another amping up of her capabilities. I thought that was really well thought out. And I thought, you know, it really showed again how Skitter is great at problem solving or running through different kind of simulations in her head and say, well, they could do this. Oh, that wouldn't work. They could do this. That wouldn't work. And, and also she used them as a neat trying to set them up as like a perimeter alarm system, you know, mm -hmm. trying to, and I thought, oh, well, that's, that's golden. She's in good shape, you know, <laughs> don't have to worry. She's got air protected. She's got the ground covered. And so everything's good and wrong. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I did like that. It took, as she's figuring out how to get the supplies from her from her lair i like the fact that it took her several different ways uh several different attempts it wasn't just oh yeah i've got this idea let me do it and poof magically it works correctly the first time i like that she did have to as you said problem solve yeah and it's interesting and i think it might give a little insight into creative writing or wild bows writing but there are a couple times where Skitter, as she's going through these things, she thinks, oh, I got to make a note to myself to improve this, you know, mm -hmm. like the bug should have easier access so that I don't have to, you know, have them go up the staircase or whatever. And I'm wonder I was wondering as I was reading through it again, if Wild Bo was thinking, oh, I could just put in that she had created this access and they go in through the little, you know, insecty door <laughs> yeah 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 i know what you mean <laughs> and uh but then he thought oh well or i could say that she can't think of everything and this would be a good way to highlight how she kind of keeps track of things she needs to improve and then you know so a little through. uh on the on the fly problem solving 
a little bit in the, the seeing into the mind of Wild Bo? I'm wondering. Yeah. I mean, because I, you know, you and I both, you know, tinkering around with writing stuff. And as you're writing things down, you're like, oh, well, somebody will think that's dumb. And you think, oh, well, I could put this in there. Mm -hmm. And I usually just go ahead and put it in that. But it's almost like he's at a maybe another level where he thinks, I'll just make it that the character thinks that mm -hmm. they should find a better way to do it and they'll do it later. Like, ah, that's pretty cool. I might steal that. <laughs> <laughs> As you were saying, Skitter organizes the folks. They come up with a way to triage. Uh, as the crowd begins to grow, she says, hey, look, um, we've got a lot of people here. We're going to move over to this this uh, clear, uh, cl relatively clean, dry um, building. Start helping everybody moving over in that direction. Once they get everybody inside, um, she's inside dealing with the gray-haired doctor lady. And she notices via her bugs that the paramedics in the in the uh, ambulance aren't moving and she goes outside to see why and discovers their lifeless bodies along with the one patient they were working on. And that was, uh, that sent the alarm bells off and we discover that mannequin is in the, in the, uh, in the house, so to speak. I want to know why wild Bo killed the gray haired doctor lady. That's what I wanted to know. Um, I mean, yeah, <laughs> she was, she was abrasive. She was, kind of hard but i for for the briefest of seconds during my first read last year for the briefest time i i kind of imagined her being i don't know a loosely affiliated part of the team not necessarily joining you know skitter's hive so to speak and becoming a minion but i don't know maybe being someone she interacted with for uh on a regular basis you know what i mean and then mannequin slit her throat so yeah goodbye to that <laughs> idea that that would have been kind of a cool path you kind of have like that gritty inner city clinic person who you know like you said is kind of abrasive but is really doing it, it to keeps, try her, to keeps her honest you know and, and smacks her down challenger exactly yeah. but, but i think one of the underlying themes here is that you have it's it's a super gritty, dark, dystopian coming of age story, yeah. you know where. <laughs> yeah. And so, if if the uh, person who's finding their way has too many sages or mentors or coaches or whatever, then you're kind of like, well, yeah, of course they turned out okay. Look at all of this help they had. So, I'm wondering if. While Bo was thinking the same thing, hey, this would be kind of a cool character. It's like, no, might give her too much help. She's got to die. <laughs> and um, it was a it was a brutal death. And Mannequin's action was deliberate. And and you know he waited for her. he had the doctor. He waited for Skitter to come back inside and then executed this poor woman in front of her as a way to send a message to Skitter and it, it it's on and she calls him out and says I have no idea how I'm going to make you pay for this but uh, that's what I'm going to do and that takes us on into into chapter 7 where we get this just incredibly brutal and um an epic fight between Skitter and Mannequin and when she took him on, I think uh, I was genuinely afraid for her safety. What about you? Oh, definitely. Yeah, I, I figured that there'd have to be some kind of Herculean rescue thing at the end of this, you know, where either aftershocks from the inbringer event cause the building to collapse and Mannequin goes in a giant sinkhole or something, or, you know, somebody shows up to help. And they're able to drive him back or Skitter, you know, basically dies and they've got to, you know, use the the paddles to bring her back figuratively. Mm -hmm. You know, some some cape shows up to bring her back to life again. But, yeah, I figured I figured she had almost no chance of survival without something miraculous happening. But again, Wild Bo, I think, shows us 
sucks that Skidder has this kind of either innate ability to subconsciously assess things and and start to almost form plans before she even knows she's thinking about it Mm -hmm. or that because of her power and the way you know bugs tend to work in the hive mind oftentimes her brain maybe splits into a bunch of different shards and and looks at all these different angles in some kind of yeah meta conscious way you had mentioned able- something like that before uh was it last episode or episode before you had speculated that something like that her power may be rewiring her brain sort of yeah yeah i'm wondering if that's the case because when you think about you know i didn't think about any of this before but because of the way mannequin is you don't know how he's sensing things you know, a normal person would have been able to spot right away that Skitter wasn't bleeding mm-hmm. and that, you know, would have checked for a pulse or something. And and she knew Mannequin wouldn't do that. And she also knew that at, on some level that he was vulnerable in the sense that he had all these moving parts that perhaps there'd be a way to gum up the works. And uh, that might be. This is where fight him. I sorry to interrupt. Uh, I think okay. The engineer in me m- might have had a little bit of a problem with Skitter figuring out the uh, attacking the mechanics of this. Maybe a little bit. I may be being a little too anal about this. Um, I mean. She's not done manufacturing. I guess that's the biggest that's the mm. biggest excuse I could make for my hesitation or or my I won't even say discomfort, but my raising an eyebrow of how at how quickly she thought to to go in and try to gum up the works. I mean, I may be looking at it from left field and people can flame me for thinking this, but that would be the only thing that I could think of that caused me some he- hesitation about her method of attacking him and thinking it through to the point where, okay, I'm going to send the bugs in and try to gum up the works sort of, um, am I being too, Mm. too anal about this too in the weeds? Not at all. I think, uh, you know, whenever we interact with something like this, like a great, great story, we bring our own experience, our own, uh, thought processes to it and you know based on us coming from an engineering background you even more so it's just natural to think of it from a, a systems standpoint mm-hmm. and that you know for a fact that people outside uh, the shop floor have no idea <laughs> how that stuff comes together mm-hmm. and you know or a, a, a very simplified idea of it but the way I looked at it, because I don't have that background, is that if I were a bug, what does what does a bug do? It tries to get into the tiniest little area. Mm-hmm. You know, it doesn't care if it's a chain that or a blade that just poked out of something. If there's a gap, it'll try to crawl in there because there might be food in there. Very true. Okay. And so thinking of it from a bug standpoint, it makes sense that, well, if I had a million bugs, then I could try to get in everywhere, any place I could see a crack, any place I could see anything. And if I was doing that, what's, you know, spiders spin webs and maybe, you know, since the silk is sticky, that would be enough to cause it, you know, and I can layer on as much as I want. Right. So I think, I think it's not, it's just a matter of perspective. I, I totally get where you're coming from and it makes total sense, but I don't think, I think the fact that Skitter didn't have the manufacturing background um, made her think more like a bug, if you will. Okay. I, I see, I see that. I see that. Let me ask you this. Um, as she's squaring off against mannequin and after at that one moment where she, uh, he slices her throat and she feigns death and she's um, beginning to, to, form her plan with her her swarm 
Um, do you think that this fight, this fight was believable in world? We know the skitter's still growing uh, as a cape and still discovering ways to maximize her power. Are you satisfied that? Uh, I mean, I I get the use of the spider silk and and the you know draping it over over him over and over again and of course he didn't realize what was going on and then you know the the paints and the uh the 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 cloth and and actually it was pretty ingenious what she did um are you satisfied the way she did this didn't break any of the the rules that wild bow has set for this world yes I am satisfied with it, but I did have to factor in some things. So one is the the huge amount of arrogance that the Slaughterhouse Nine had. Mm. You know, um, they don't think they can be defeated. Right. Because they it over, almost never happens. So and then especially fighting against a 16 year old girl fairly new to their powers. I'm guessing Mannequin just totally underestimated her. The second thing kind of reminds me of, I don't know if you remember the movie Gattaca Mm -hmm. with, with Ethan Hawke, but you know, it's, it's that the forefront of genetic uh, engineering and you have some people that are just, you know, they pick the best gene combination. And so they're gifted right out of the gate and Ethan Hawke's character isn't. And so he just realizes that, the deck is stacked against him. So he's got nothing to lose. So he just goes all out all the time. And so Skitter gets into the situation. Her dad's down, doesn't know what's going on with him. Tattletail might be dead. The plans to do stuff with the slaughterhouse nine and with her plans are all looking like crap at the moment. And so I'm thinking she's just like, all right, well, I, I got nothing to lose now. This is, this is do or die. I'm just going to leave it all on the field kind of thing. And so taking those two factors in the arrogance and the super desperation made it work for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My own um, trepidations and hesitations about the minor details set aside. uh, It was a thoroughly enjoyable, if not terrifying, (laughs) terrifying (laughs) chapter. Uh, And could we say that there were several superhero esque moments from Skitter? I'm thinking in particular of the time, uh, that moment when that poor little baby boy uh, cried out and Mannequin went to go slaughter uh, the mom and the kid and, and Skitter jumped up and, and, and body tackled him, you know? Definitely. Yeah. Again, the showing her desperation and just, you know, nothing to lose attitude. She heard the probabilities, just like mm-hmm. all of the group did, and she knows that uh, her power, you know, if you had to compare it one to one, doesn't really seem to stack up with bitch or Gru, and so you think, wow, this is really David versus Goliath here, and so yeah, it's very heroic what she does. I kept expecting things like when they, you know, wrap the head around the the post and stuff that it it would open up an orifice and bite him or something. Like that. <laughs> yeah. I, I kept thinking things would get worse, but luckily it didn't get that that would have been having to push the believe button a little bit, I think, if it had turned into like a a thing where it, it just wouldn't die, you know, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. the head grows legs and runs and reattaches itself or whatever. But uh who knows with mannequin, right? Anything's possible. But uh, yeah, I, I love the fight, even if I was biting all my fingernails off the whole time. Pretty much, pretty much. I remember when I read this the first time and when the, the swarm finally arrives. And, you know, I have no idea what what this chick is going to do with these bugs. And it took me, I, I guess I was like mannequin, not knowing what she was doing with these things, trying, you know, passing over them several times until the chain began to uh, uh, began to uh, gum up in the works. And, and uh, I started realizing, Oh, the spice, the, the silk is accumulating in there. And yeah, the mechanisms are now being affected by that, but it was, it was terrifying. I mean, 
They're bugs, Taylor. You're not going to knock them over. What are you doing? What are you doing? My goodness. Yeah, I I couldn't couldn't foresee how no matter how large the swarm of bugs got that it would ever do any good. But yeah, I think she like I said, I think she thinks a little bit like a bug at times and somehow perceives more of their innate characteristics than she is aware of. And that helps her help her formulate a plan and, and ultimately at least have a stalemate. Yeah. You know, she got him to leave. Now, the one thing I did struggle with, we're going to touch a bit on in the next chapter is just that, uh, I know her, her armor's really good and, and they've talked about the, uh, abilities of it and that, that kind of thing. But I would have thought she would have been in a lot worse shape, <laughs> mm. but I think she's gotten better too at dodging. So maybe that, that factors into it too. All right. Well, let's revisit that. Put a pin in that for a moment. Cause I did want to ask you the two minutes that roughly two minutes that it took her to uh, get the swarm from her layer to, to the uh, facility, the building that the, everyone was located. How'd you like that as a tension builder? Because it wasn't just a meet. I mean, she, she went in after mannequin, she went down feigning death. And then we had to wait the, uh, the two minutes for the swarm to arrive. Uh, how'd you like that? I actually thought that could have been a little bit ratcheted up. I think there was still time in the air where Skitter was, you know, formulating her to-do list of like, oh, that'd be a good thing to add. Going into her mental utility kit once again. Exactly. Yeah. And that, I guess it's probably because my brain operates in such a different way. It doesn't splinter in or fragment like that and be able to multitask to that level. I would have just been like 159, <laughs> 158. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. And so that, that took a little bit out of the tension out of it for me, her little uh, flights to go take care of the, the shopping list type thing. But I, I thought it was really well done. I just, the the tension for me really came from racking my brain on how she was going to do anything mm. worthwhile against Mannequin. You know, I was, I was thinking, is she going to try to pick up everybody and fly them out on bugs? I just, right. I couldn't, the idea of Mannequin having any impact from this stuff was just, I, I couldn't even fathom it. So, And once again, we have one of these um, points where, uh, the narrator Taylor, uh, isn't sharing everything with us that she's <laughs> already is planning. She knows what she's planning, but, uh, uh, she's not sharing that with us. She's folk for, from our point of view in her side, her head, it's all about the fight in the immediate vicinity. So we didn't know why she was bringing these bugs in different pairs and until they actually got there and began working on them. And, um, oh yeah, we got some, some assist for her as she, um, as mannequins mechanisms are, are being messed up and things aren't retracting into their, their various, uh, body parts. And she begins to yank his head from his torso, uh, and is connected to a chain. And, and one of the spot, the bystanders comes to help out. He he sees that she's struggling and tries to give her a hand to take it and wrap it around some some bar some uh some bars that are in the floor. I like to think I've I've got a decent amount of ba bravery and that I would probably step in in some situations, but that old scene had me saying, "Oh hell no!" <laughs> I mean, this is, this is this is the slaughterhouse night. I'm, <laughs> I'm out there trying to jumpstart a car or dig into a burrow, burrow into a pile of garbage, anything to try to. <laughs> so ghosts, Andy's, you know, I mean, Andy's a no for helping Skitter. Okay, all right, let me write that down. <laughs> I'm a no for helping Mother Teresa against the slaughterhouse night. I'm just, I'm gone. But you know, as as you mention it it's probably some of the same thing that's going on with Skitter. You know, you probably have a lot of people in that level of despair and that, that point of, you know what? I got nothing to lose. Yeah. You know, and, and just the dude just jumps in and helps, but yeah, there's no way I would have done that. So Skitter, Skitter 
at least, as you say, fights him to a stalemate. Mannequin has inflicted injury and, and, and killed several people, but he's leaving, you know, multicolored and, and in tatters himself. <laughs> he he did not get out of that fight uh, unmolested or unmarred. So once he leaves, he uh, I believe he departs leaving his head and his arm. Skitter uh, um, is completely exhausted and hurting, and she orders uh, Sierra. Well, actually, I believe it's uh, here. We have this line regarding um, Mannequin's body parts. Throw the head and the arm into the ocean, I said to no one in particular. If you can find a boat, drop it somewhere deep. Okay, Charlotte said, her voice quiet. I'm going to go. I'll be using my bug to watch for more trouble, I said, as I began limping toward the door. I'd won so to speak. And that takes us on into chapter eight. And it's, it's the next morning and our little bug girl is hurting and trying to, uh, trying to get herself roused to face the day. And I think again, I, I didn't think about it at the time, but the fact that she got so little sleep, I think again, points back to, uh, her level of, despair or how distraught she is you know i i use the term sometimes hyper vigilance mm-hmm. you know where there's there's so much crap that's gone on that no matter how exhausted how beat up you are it's impossible to turn it off you know that you're still uh, i've never been in combat or anything like that you know kudos to the the people that serve and are able to do that mm-hmm. we should do all we can to help folks that that suffer the consequences of that and and sad that we don't do more, but um, I'm imagining that it's, it's like that, that, you know, you hear a bump in the night and you know, you're, you're transported back. You don't know what it could be, but you know, it could be dangerous. So you gotta, you gotta wake up in an instant and be ready to respond. And so she's just got had, you know, the butt kicking of all butt kickings and uh, fought this, this, you know, huge villain to a standstill and she's only able to manage four hours of sleep. So I think that again is indicative of her state of mind, given all the crap going on. She gets up and, and she heads downstairs to uh, the next floor in her lair and down there talking, waiting for her are Charlotte and Sierra. And the place is, the place is a disaster as you would expect. Um, I believe it at one point she passed through the the floor where her bugs were and she, yeah, she had commented on um, how she had wanted plastic uh, terrariums for her, her insects, which was a smart move, but the girls get together and um, Taylor's desperately searching for something breakfasty to eat. And it's, it's not happening. Um, All the glass containing spices and, condiments and whatever have spoiled practically everything in the place. And uh, we have this, this moment where the girls are looking at her and, and once again, Taylor is extremely aware of seeming vulnerable mortal, so to speak in the eyes of her employees. Yeah. And I think that really pointed it out to me how, you know, Taylor is only uh, a teenage girl uh, in the sense that, when I was that age and I think most teenagers that age, it's all about you're sure people are looking at your shortcomings Mm -hmm. and you're sure people are viewing you in the worst possible light. Uh, Whereas in some cases, and I think later on in the, in this chapter, it's pointed out that it's not that I'm sure there was part of it that was how bad she looked and, and that kind of thing. Yeah. But I think part of it is just kind of, maybe a little bit of awe almost that, all right, I'm standing next to somebody who's my age that just went toe to toe with like one of the worst things on the planet. Good point. I hadn't thought of, of it that she way. She didn't know. And then she's up and walking around and like, she's going to clean up too. So I think there was a little bit of just, you know, just, whoa, I, I can't believe I'm hanging out with this person. And, you know, I was in school with her six months ago. You know, you you put it that way, and I tend to believe that's probably the more correct way to look at it. So, Skitter, they weren't looking at Taylor 
as being weak. I think you're, I buy into your, your, uh, your premise here. Well, and I, I didn't come to that conclusion on my own. I mean, I, I came to it after later in the chapter when the people start showing up and kind of just saying that, mm -hmm. you know, that, uh, we heard you were here. We ran with gangs. We thought you were nice and, and not tough enough, but then we heard what you did and now we want to join. So, and I started thinking back and, oh, well, maybe that, that's how other people, they thought, oh, she's just a normal person. And it's like, oh, she's just a normal person who took on the Russian army by herself and <laughs> pushed him out of the Ukraine. So, uh, yeah, she's pretty bad, but, and uh, I don't know how to really deal with that. <laughs> she sends Charlotte on a mission. Um, she sends them, sends Charlotte over to get information from Regent regarding Tattletale and the father, her dad, obviously. And after she uh, sends her on her way, uh, she has Sierra go downstairs, see about uh, salvaging anything worth eating. And, uh, she goes upstairs to commence the cleaning up. And then shortly thereafter, Gru shows up and is just astonished and kind of irritated that she put herself in danger like that for people she doesn't know. I think they all have trouble wrapping their head around how heroic uh, or how, how much to the hero side that Skitter leans. You know, she's not near as uh, self-serving, I think, as the rest of the undersiders. Not that they're, you know, out and out selfish or uncaring, but the probabilities were there. It was all there on paper, mm -hmm. black and white, looking like this is going to be a death match here and you're not going to win. And so, you know, it's it's like that line from the Matrix, right? When you meet an agent, you run, just right. like the rest of us. Mm -hmm. And instead, now she just turned and said, I'm not running. And, and yeah, so Gru is, and Gru likes her, you know, I mean, not like a little sister, you know, a friend, a yeah. member of the team. And, uh, and she's just kind of in his mind, at least took a huge gamble of basically just like throwing her life away. And he just doesn't want her to be going into a cycle of self-destruction. Yeah. He calls her on that and says, uh, at a point a little bit later in the chapter, she's, she's done some very untailor like things. It appears to him in the last several weeks. And he's asking her why, um, before we get to that. Sierra uh, was at the hospital, if you recall, when uh, Skitter called and she was visiting her mom and dad. And um, Taylor asked her how everything went there. And as the conversation goes on, she, uh, Sierra asked her about what she'd been hearing about the situation with Armsmaster, about uh, how... Mm the the word was that taylor wanted to be a hero was going to turn against her teammate and this and that um uh what you, were your thoughts on that con that portion of the conversation a little self-reflection from from taylor yeah and i think it's it's natural for that kind of thing to happen in the story but it's cool that wild bow brings it up it's another world building thing uh if you will that doesn't really occur to me as a reader, but these people are all living in this world and reputations are going to continue to build and rumors are going to continue to circulate. People are going to hear things. People are going to find things out and people's uh, reputation is going to grow or shrink or change mm -hmm. based on all this stuff. And so, and especially in a place like Brockton Bay after huge amount of devastation there's going to be wild speculation on everything under the sun tons of word of mouth telephone game stuff where story starts out that somebody stubbed their toe and then it ends up that you know oh an end breaker bit it off you know <laughs> it's like what yeah oh what i dropped a brick on it i mean come on <laughs> uh, so God. uh it's it's natural that this stuff will come around and uh, but yeah, it's it's cool to see that the legend is growing, if you will. Mm -hmm. The story is is continuing to evolve, 
not only to the part that we see as the reader, you know, the the moment to moment, but also the world, the story in the world is growing and people are hearing different parts of it and then it gets shared in, which is cool. As Brian and Taylor are talking, um, Sierra decides to give them some privacy and heads out to the beach. Uh <laughs> When he hears that that Taylor took on took on mannequin and this this line this reply from her to his, the question are you suicidal and Taylor says he's not that strong I said defensively I mean he's scary as blank he's strong but he's beatable and you have a girl you're crazy for trying to take him on I mean come on I haven't thought about it until this moment but. Mm-hmm. I wonder if this is another aspect of Taylor's kind of insect mind, if you'll well, if you let me call it that. Okay. In the in the life of the hive, the death of one member is inconsequential. And so if a part of her is kind of almost thinking of herself as part of the swarm, you know, maybe the queen bee, but still mm-hmm. part of the swarm, then that's gonna as a side effect, make her feel a little more expendable or not as precious as like a human typically would. And so that might start coloring her thinking more. Really? Um, you know. think so? Is know. it just a healthy speculation? I mean, that's a fascinating way to look at it. You, you think her mind might be going that way? Well, you know, if, I mean, I keep building on this, this wacko thread I've created where, <laughs> um, you know, Taylor's mind is, is turning into a million different little minds that can also interact with the bugs and on, on a stronger level. Mm-hmm. There, there are probably side effects to that. Right. And so I'm, yeah, I think this is more speculation, but um, it, it, it sort of makes sense. I guess I can, I can talk a good game about it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you're saying. Brian shares with her after Sierra leaves. Uh, Brian does share with Taylor the good news that her dad is okay. And the concerning news that Lisa is, as we know, grievously injured. She's not going to die, but she's going to be a, going to have a, an ugly scar and, Brian questions uh, whether or not she's whether or not Tattletale is actually realizing the situation she's in, and then we get a discussion from Taylor about how she sees Tattletale and some of the other members of the team. Yeah, that was an interesting interaction, uh, and it it bugged me. I couldn't think of the word either. Foolhardy came to mind, but then Drew uses that word later mm-hmm. in the same chapter. And so it's like, okay, that, that driven was another thing that came to mind. Uh, but then he, that word gets used in the text as well. So it's kind of like, well, if they're thinking about that when they're talking, they would have thought about it when they yeah. were trying to think of the word. So, yeah. <laughs> so I don't know what word Wild Bo was looking for there. Did you come up with a word? Nah, just reckless, but no. Yeah. Uh Oh, no, not in that context. No, sorry. Um. So as the two are talking, uh, Sierra begins to signal Taylor by tapping the uh, the cube that she has. And the two of them, after Taylor throws on her uh, her costume, the two of them head out to the beach. And Skitter has her first recruits, um, some leftovers, some refugees from the ABB. Surprise? Well, I got to just flip back to her getting ready. So mm-hmm. on the one moment, you know, she's barely able to move around. And then, you know, she gets dressed as quickly as, as she ever has. And then Wild Bo kind of backtracks a little bit and says, oh, wait, she's she's grievously injured. So I should put something in here that it hurt like hell. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I don't know if you can remember playing uh, those flag football tournaments and that last game of the tournament having to get dressed again it was like oh it hurts just to put up it's just to tie my shoelace oh yeah you know and i so i can't imagine if i'd been playing 
uh, or get beat up the way she was beat up to that. I would have got, I would have put any clothes on quickly. Yeah. It wasn't but, a moving anyway. fast going on. No, <laughs> no, <laughs> only, only to the Advil bottle. I was pretty exactly. fast getting to that, but that was about it. Um, but, uh, yeah, the recruits, uh, that I was surprised at that, but, uh, wild Bo, I think does a great job of explaining that, that, uh, She's got street cred now in right. spades. I mean, she right. is she's built up so much cred. She took on the the three hundred pound gorilla, you know, and lived to tell the tale. And it had to tuck its well, do gorillas have tails? Tuck its tail between its legs and head out. So, so yeah, there's lots of people that are kind of foot soldiers at heart, if you will. That's what mm-hmm. they know, and they they haven't had a general for a long time. And, you know, the whole city's a mess. So it makes sense that they would start trying to find somebody to follow, find a, a, a worthy leader. And Taylor Skidder is showing that that she could definitely be that. Yeah. Um, do you think those three are going to be trouble? Rue seems to indicate that he thinks that uh, she's going to have to keep an eye on them long term. It depends. And and I think Wild Bo does a great job of as we'll see in the interludes and stuff, getting into the dynamics of any group. But I tend to, and I think you're the same way, come from the perspective of if the leader, if the coach walks the walk and talks the talk, then the the people will fall in line. The players mm-hmm. will fall in line. There'll always be a couple knuckleheads. There'll always be some outliers. But if the other folks come around enough, oftentimes they are self-policing. They'll either drive out the person that's not uh, conforming and not following the plan, not following the strategy, or they will find a way to get them to uh, level up, you know, to, to fall in line. So I'm thinking that, you know, there, there are going to be things and, and they touch on it, you know, where some of the people are complaining, but they're Mm -hmm. not complaining to Taylor. They're just complaining that, you know, they'd rather be out cracking heads than uh, picking up trash. But everybody like, wants to have. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say it sounds like, yeah, she's got a plan as far as using that uh, that building to uh, to house her future soldiers or as a as a gathering place, maybe a, a you know a shelter when need be. She seems to be working it through uh, pretty effectively. Yeah, and I think, you know, the benefit of a, being an early joiner typically is that you have a better chance of promotion, mm-hmm. that more people are going to come. You're going to need lieutenants to kind of or sergeants, whatever you want to call it. And so if you want to be in kind of a leadership role, there's going to be that opportunity. And so you've got to pay your dues a little bit. You might have to pick up some trash, do some Joe jobs or whatever, but down the road, you get to tell other people to do the Joe jobs and you get to do more exciting stuff, you know, plan out stuff or whatever. So, so yeah, I think, I think it'll work. Uh, the fact that, you know, like I said, she's got a lot of credibility right now. That's going to bring in a lot of folks and it's going to keep them in line. And they kind of liked the idea she was organizing. They just thought she was weak and now they know that's not true. So. After she sends her new employees to inside the building to begin the cleanup operation, uh, she and Gru, and we're we're moving toward the end of the chapter. She and Gru continue the conversation about how hard driving she is uh, and how reckless she appears to be right now. And she opens up to uh, him about her plan, and it says here, um, here is here was the leap of faith. The test of my trust in him, referring to Gru. Because if I don't amaze Coil, if I don't force his hand and give him absolutely no reason to say I failed, he's going to keep Dinah. Ultimately, that's what it comes down to is her desire to free Dinah. And at this moment um, in the writing, she's taking a leap of faith and letting Gru in on a plan that previously only she and Tattletail were privy to. It is a big leap of faith, but I think it's warranted. Rue has that same kind of protector mentality, uh, as we saw with him 
trying to uh, help out his sister and, you know, secure a place to live and be able to uh, show that he could be her uh, guardian while she was a minor. And so I think, I think Taylor's taken a risk here, but it's a pretty calculated risk. Also, just before this, Gru had mentioned that, you know, hey, I'm not on board with capturing little girls either. So, right. so I think it's okay. Uh, I think it's one thing though to kind of brainstorm with with one friend about, well, yeah, it might come to this, and then it's another thing to actually say it out into the world that I might have to take on our boss. <laughs> mm-hmm. So that's a big step. But she did just fight Mannequin. So it's like, oh, Coil. Maybe. <laughs> <That's easy>. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, we will see. <laughs> it, we will see if that uh, that trust and faith in him pays off. And now we move on into the first interlude, uh, interlude number twelve, Jack, and we get a lovely visit from the Slaughterhouse Nine as they come to crash the party thrown by the merchants. Um. So I remember asking if. Skid Mark was was kind of a two dimensional character way back when, but like arc mm-hmm. three or four, or whatever it was. At this moment, and looking at this now during my my second read of Worm, I, I begin to wonder if all these guys existed for was for this moment, for the nine <laughs> to just come and waste. Other than this, did. Did Skidmark and his crew, did they advance the story any? Uh, am I missing something? Well, I felt like they played a couple of pivotal roles. I okay. mean, they were, there was the whole scene in the mall mm-hmm. where they uh, were, were trying to trigger people and they had the, you know, battle to the death in the octagon or whatever you want to call it. And right. So, I think that that cast an important different angle of light on the whole being able to acquire powers or powers in a bottle kind of okay. thing. Okay. True. And that's also the, the the moment when Skitter and I think Paddletail both had kind of the vision of something beyond our world interacting with things. Okay, and maybe influencing things. So they were kind of a a monkey's paw, if you will. You know, they were just showed up as a a, a vehicle in the storyline, just to you know, oh, here's I want to bring this info in, and we'll use these folks to do that. But it, it could just be also that I mean, they're scumbags. They're they're drug peddling scumbags and i just don't like that so that 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 could be where i'm coming from also i'm right with you there when i when i saw that this this chapter was starting out with this i was just like oh man not right not the merchants again and then <laughs> slaughterhouse nine shows up and i'm almost like i'm kind of cheering for the slaughterhouse <laughs> nine I, I feel really bad about that but it's okay if the merchants were just gone oh gosh and it, another uh, brutal uh, disgusting takedown um the use of let's see here uh as i think back to the arc where he visited purity this is the first time we've seen in the story we've seen jack use his power if i'm not mistaken what were your impressions of that well, no, he, I mean, he cut Tattletail's face. Tattletail, right? okay, right, 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 yeah. So there okay. was one other thing, but yeah, I didn't know he was this adept, mm-hmm. but it makes sense. If he's the leader, that he's got to have some kind of otherworldly, very creepy kind of power. Uh, I mean, it's one thing to, you know, have some giant beam of light like this guy has and blow holes through things, mm-hmm. but it's a whole other thing to have, you know, the, the, like this uh, projectile razor blade kind of thing or straight razor that can just eviscerate people and you're like oh I thought I felt something it's like oh my stomach's hanging out <laughs> so I mean that that definitely 
would scare the heck out of people. So very impressive power that he has and, and very fear provoking. We get as the nine, the various members of the nine wade into the crowd. We get a view at them, uh, each of them doing their thing. Um, Siberian laying waste to people. Um, bone saw induces a, a huh. plague. And, 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 at one point, Jack was like, "Hey, you know, uh, you know how I feel about plagues. You shouldn't, you shouldn't uh, do that. It'll cheat your teammates." And she's all like, "Oh, no more than five rounds, and I, I promise it's not a real plague. It'll die out." And oh, thanks. You know, I mean, I got this image of you saw Cloverfield, right? The first one. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That scene where the poor girl who got bit by one of those. Uh, Oh, right. those parasites she exploded and i just i just kept having that image as as, oh, man. as i yeah. was listening to this thing in the audio but oh geez and um we get a detailed description of crawler and and how he regenerates and um the siberian yeah um something interesting she seems to be able to transfer her invulnerability to people she's touching. Yeah, I didn't, I, I'm interested to learn more about that, how that works. It almost sounded like, you remember the, the man Kazin wars books? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. The, yeah. Mm -hmm. the inertialist drive mm -hmm. where, you know, the, the big thing that they talk about in like super fast space travel is that you, you know, you hit the brakes and everybody turns into jelly. <laughs> exactly. So, You're a bug um, on a windshield. Or, yeah. Or it takes you, you know, a parsec to turn the ship. So, so this inertialist drive thing is that you can be going any amount of things, but you can basically turn off inertia so that, you know, you, you don't suffer the consequences. If you, it allows you to change direction very, very quickly or. Right. Come to a stop quickly. And so uh, that's almost the impression I got from her power was that it's not necessarily that she's transferring the invulnerability but that she creates an area where she has she's able to cancel inertia oh okay and by right. touching someone yeah she can extend that to to them. right very yeah. cool crawler um <laughs> spitting caustic venom uh, i guess it's a paralytic and uh yeah oily black skin and armor and uh so his whole regeneration is is about his whole plan is about making himself more and more invulnerable um trying to head himself toward inbringer status maybe it seems like it it's hard to know what the motivation might be there because in this brief encounter, it seems like he's pretty much achieved invulnerability for all intents and purposes. I mean, he loses a giant chunk of his head and his body, and in seconds, he's back up and moving. So I don't know what else he would need to need to do. And the description on the size, you know, a head the size of a small car and 10 foot wide chest, not wide, but in depth. Deep, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so he's, it sounds like he's not as big as an end bringer, but he could be like an end bringer, a little brother. Yeah. And so it's hard to predict. And it, it's neat the way wild Bo gets into uh, Jack talk, thinking about the dynamics and how to balance everybody. Carrots and but, sticks. Uh, yeah. But, but you wonder, I, I guess I just have a hard time wrapping my head around that being a motivator that, oh, maybe this person can destroy me. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. And uh, as you mentioned, Jack, uh, trying to keep the di the group dynamic working and um, he does go through the various uh, carrots and sticks for each of the members of the team. And for, I believe it was for Crawler, his carrot would be to actually fight the Siberian to see what uh, she could do to advance his metamorphosis. Yeah, it's, uh, I don't know. It's, they've all got these things they're trying to figure out. And yeah, that description of a six inch skull and mm -hmm. each 
small size brain and then wasn't there something about each of the armor plates has an eye in it or something? Too? Yeah, and, he's got like a hundred eyes across his body because it said at one point each of the eyes blinked to clear the <laughs> dust and blood off of him. Yeah, it's yeah, so... <laughs> <laughs> lovely imagery. Um, uh, Jack, yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was done. Okay, um, Jack sits on top of this this uh this powder keg uh i i like in this instance where wild Bo once again is giving depth to to this heinous group of characters um that he seems challenged by the idea of trying to keep these various members in in line so to speak playing them off each other yeah i, I think it even mentions that that's his character you know right. that he that's what keeps him in the game. And and I think that provides a valuable insight because maybe it's just my kind of goody two-shoes nature, but I really struggle trying to understand the evil mind and the evil mindset mm-hmm. and what would keep people doing that. And, you know, in this case, if Jack has this kind of master strategist power, and uh, he's just trying to solve uh, more and more complex calculus equations or logic problems or whatever. And that's now instead of just stuff on paper, it's people that could kill him. And so that makes that much more exciting. And he's kind of an adrenaline junkie. Then, then yeah, you could see that having that particular type of slip disk mind. Mm-hmm that would be very appealing to him. And so it makes it, it all kind of holds together logically at that point, rather than just like, why are these people so messed up? Cherish. Yeah. Oh, Cherish, Cherish is, uh, <laughs> Cherish has got trouble. So at one point, uh, after everyone has gone off to carve up various members of the, uh, the remaining members of the merchants, Jack and, and Cherish are standing next to each other. And that goes, um, are you going to partake? Jack asked Cherish. Why are you still talking to me? Like I'm a member of this team. I tried to manipulate all of you and I failed. And then the two of them go in to have a conversation. And, um, apparently bone saw is cooking up something specific for, for, um, Cherish. That's going to be revealed at a later time. And, uh, she can't, you know, suss out exactly what it is, but she could feel that, uh, that, uh, bone saw was working on something and, and she's frightened beyond deservedly. So uh, nobody is going to feel sorry for cherish, but it's fascinating to see her be this frightened at this moment when she knows she's in grave danger and she did it to herself. She wanted to join this party. So, Hey, yeah, it's, it's interesting. A little part of me keeps hoping that there'll be, you know, wheels within wheels kind of thing where I knew that you knew that I knew that you knew. Mm-hmm. And so I I laid this other trap. Um, so I keep hoping there'll be something like that uh, just because the Slaughterhouse Nine is so horrible. Uh, it'd be neat to see them get their comeuppance when they thought they had tricked the trickster. Mm hmm. But I'm not holding out much hope for that. <laughs> it appears that train wreck is dead. Um, yeah, we got this one section. It says, uh, one by one, the members of the nine seemed to notice Mannequin's appearance. This was after uh, Mannequin arrived on the scene. Um, Shatterbird stepped back from ru- the ruined husk of a massive suit of steaming armor and started flying their way, accompanied by a cloud of bloody glass shards um that's got to be a description of uh of train wreck wouldn't you say i hadn't really thought that at the time but now that you mention it i think you're right yeah so that's it's kind of bizarre that it's just this kind of side note in here well i mean we've noticed before uh, you've picked on it more often or not uh than i have uh wild bull throw these little nuggets in here so Hmm. Brain wreck was still in undercover and uh well um ripped to to train wreck, I guess, you know. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. 
So I, I, I think you're right. The group reconvenes uh, upon the return of uh, of Mannequin, and they see the state he is in, and they they kind of mar- mock him a little bit. Jack calls him Alan by his name, and and that kind of mm-hmm. uh, bristles him a little bit. And they begin to discuss the proposal from Tattletale, and uh, they lay out some some rules that they're going to follow by. What did you think of that? Well, at the time, as I was reading it, I thought it was kind of convoluted and a little contrived. But then when Jack is thinking about the dynamics, you realize, well, that's how he makes it more interesting for himself mm-hmm. and how he keeps it keeps it enjoyable. It even mentions that talking about Shatterbird, he lets her do her thing when they get to a new place so that she can feel accomplished and a valuable member even though to him it's boring and it's the same mm-hmm. thing every time. And, and so you can tell that the new, the unique, uh, the variations are what really grab him. And so, you know, it's kind of like, you know, some of those uh, like Ninja warrior competitions where it's like, well, we used to do this thing where you had to jump from one ladder to the next, but now we're going to make the ladders move. Yeah, Cause that yeah. was too easy. <laughs> you know? And so, mm-hmm. um, putting in new wrinkles all the time to, to keep it interesting. And it seems a little bit much, but they've been at this a long time. So they're going to have to keep kind of expanding things uh, and adding new rules to make it, make it stay fresh. Right. Right. And the last line is uh, Jack. Um, he smiled to himself. Uh, These challenges after all served as his own carrot. And uh, yeah, you had, uh, you had pointed that out. And so, um, they're going to, they're going to come up with some rules, deliver them to the, uh, the town, the heroes and villains. And we're going to see what goes on from there. (laughs) And that moves us on into the final section we're going to cover tonight, which is the bonus interlude 12.5. And we get to meet Jamie. And Jamie is a young lady who has been uh, spending her time trying to figure out how to get powers. We find out through this, through this chapter that she's actually battery. And this is kind of an origin story for her. Kind of, kind of crazy how she drives out to that barn in the middle of nowhere, gets ready to leave. And suddenly in the middle of this barn is a gateway to a, uh, ostensibly what looks like the interior of a hospital or a lab. Yeah, I thought this whole interlude was really well done. I it didn't seem like it was gonna fit in here very well. It seemed kind of disjointed as I was reading it, but uh it's a neat twist on the whole origin story. You know, it's got some of the typical things there, you know, family member uh was negatively negatively impacted, so I've gotta seek revenge. I, I like the twist that uh, you know, the as you put it, capes are us emporium. Mm-hmm. had kind of set up these honeypot sites and were monitoring to see who was looking for stuff and then, you know, trying to see who they could get as potential clients and, you know, having way too much information, you know, oh, I've got this place that nobody knows about. Yeah, we'll buy it for 735 you know, it's <laughs> yeah. it's like, right. Oh, I guess somebody did know about it. Uh-huh. But then the, get to the whole twist of, well, the, it's neat the way they have... <laughs> Kind of, I'm picturing these spreadsheets with graphs on them. Oh yeah, <laughs> uh-huh. yeah. So, and if you do, we can we can adjust the graph here, and now you're into this range where you might get this, but you could get this bad thing. So, what do you want? And I thought that was pretty neat. You know, the very, very nerd, very side believable. <laughs> if if you had an organization that had whatever the service, whether it's <laughs> providing. <laughs> superpowers in a vial or or how much um land you can buy up in prescott uh you know they've got their brochures and they've got their selling points and how to how to lure you in or even in like like manufacturing right you're yeah, yeah. you tell people all right for this level of precision and this level of tolerance we're looking at this much time to build and this cost 
you know, if you don't need it that precise, it'll be a little cheaper, a little quicker. If you need it more precise, it's going to take longer. It's going to cost more. Right. So there's always those uh, cost benefit uh, analysis and stuff. But yeah, it's kind of weird to apply it to parahuman abilities. It's just like, uh, yeah, you know, can I get that without the grilled onions? Yeah, just. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. Yeah. yeah. So, so now we have confirmed what this what this uh, mm. this interlude does confirm for us is as of this moment there appear there are in fact two different ways to get powers via a natural, if you will, uh, trigger event or out of a test tube. Right, and we've got a name for the organization and and a face to it now. You know, part of me wonders if the the person is really more of like a sales engineer rather than the mastermind behind the the cauldron. But uh, mm -hmm. but she does a good job of pitching it and, and getting it all set up. But then the whole thing with with Madcap, I thought was was excellently done by Wild Bo. Really, you know, kind of turning the tables on the nemesis and. Uh, you know, the the adversary and, mm -hmm. and, you know, the usual result. And then it turned out to be, no, you know what? I'll join you. And since you're a battery, I'll be assault. for it. Assault. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and, and that just drives her. She's like, no, I don't want to do this. This, is, this isn't happening. This is a nightmare. Uh, be, battery. But, yeah. 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 Before we get to that, uh, a little bit further into the into the preparation, the, the discussion that Jamie had with the doctor, the testing, and then the actual consumption of the, of the liquid itself. Uh, th there was quite the build up to that actual moment where she, uh, she actually consumed it. It wasn't just a matter of, okay, well, here's your three quarters of a million dollars, drink this. And suddenly she's, you know, Diana Prince running around with the last, <laughs> something like that. Well, and, and again, I really appreciate Wild Bo doing that. You would hate, you know, it's like Peter Parker getting bit by the spider, right? It's not, mm -hmm. it's not a fun experience for him. You know, he's, he's racked with pain. He's getting all these, you know, weird flashes in his brain. Everything's kind of getting hyped up. And then, you know, he, he falls asleep. He wakes up in the morning and everything's weird. And uh, so you want it to be something, a trial by fire kind of thing. You know, you want it to be something that's, that's hard to go through. Uh, otherwise it's, it just cheapens the whole thing. You know, if it's just, yeah, here, put the sticker on your neck and boom, mm -hmm. you know, you're yeah. Wonder woman. So, so yeah, I thought he did, he did a great job of describing that and making it uh, a rite of passage uh, worthy of gaining powers. Yeah, she she was driven, as you said, uh, because of how mm. her her father was uh, was a police officer, a detective, and and a particular case went south on him, and she was kind of driven by the injustice of it and wanted to, wanting to correct that injustice, and that's what uh, drove her to Cauldron, and Cauldron is real. They're they're able to generate and give superpowers. Um, Sounds like they've done quite a bit of testing. They've got to be underground, pretty pretty deep for uh, for only bits and pieces and and rumor to be t uh, talked about. What was it uh, they did? Apparently, are responsible for wiping out someone who said uh, the person who posted that rumor about people selling powers. That was back in what arc, like uh, five or six or something mm. like that. Yeah, you would figure that. You know, as you were developing the cauldron business plan, you would need to plan for the contingencies and you would probably try to work out deals and in your testing, get people who could either erase memories or people who were great at assassination or intimidation to be able to, you know, keep it under wraps. But as far as testing it a lot, I mean, if you know, since I'm such a fanboy, if there was a chance I could buy superpowers, 
I would definitely be searching the internet a lot, trying <laughs> to figure out if that was legit. And man, if I could learn to fly or so, you know, mm-hmm. do something like that, oh, that'd be just amazing. So she she takes the 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 vial. Oh well, you know what? Let me back up for a second. Um, how to phrase this? Uh, do you want to speculate on how Cauldron um generates these superpowers? Now, keeping in mind, you, you're currently you have a, a an idea floating around in your head about the uh, natural, we'll say for lack of a better phrase, the natural mm-hmm. triggers where these what may or may not be otherworldly beings are impacting apparently Earth. Um, do you want to posit a thought on how a business is giving superpowers or uh, this is our first real deep dive into them. Do you need more time? No, no, I've got, I've got a definite theory about this. I mean, just as there are tinkers like mannequin who can figure out how to do enclosed environments and all sorts of wild ways of trying to protect themselves I'm guessing there, and there's, you know, there's bone saw as well. I'm guessing there are neurochemical tinkers for want of a better term. Okay. And you probably had somebody who maybe was like Clark Griswold from uh, Nash Lampoon's uh, family vacation, you know, some kind of <laughs> chemist who got uh, a trigger event and realized that uh, they could start concocting things. Oh, I see. And, you know, decanting Mm-hmm. detecting what happened in a person's body when they were triggered and then synthesizing it. And they were able to then uh, start, you know, expanding what was available and, and ingering with the formulas and coming up with, oh, okay, this is the kind of thing you need for flight. This is what you need for strength. You know, this is what you need for invulnerability. And realizing that since not everybody's going to be able to go through a trigger event that, you know, and if, if the person was a business person, that that could be a viable business and could also be very, you know, kind of like the idea in some of the Iron Man movies where it's like, well, we developed the, the suit, but what if we developed the whole army of these things, mm-hmm. you know, and then then we could combat the superpower people. You know, and we need to keep them in line uh, or whatever else might come around the corner. So anyway, yeah, I think it's some kind of neurochemical tinker that figured out how to synthesize what happens when a trigger event occurs. Okay. All right. Well, let's hold on to that theory and see if uh, see if that plays out. So uh, after Jamie takes her her potion and she gets her powers and she goes and she confronts Madcap. And we find out that, uh, you know, he messes with her and defeats her several times until I think it was on her eighth tryout when she's actually got her, her costume name as Battery. And she's a member of the Protectorate. And finally, when he's trying to do one of his breakout jobs, they capture him. Yeah, and we we knew it it might be a long road when it came out that that uh, Jamie wasn't going to be able to afford the same level of power that Madcap had. So she was going to have to come up with strategies, and oftentimes that's trial and error. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it was neat the way she finally did kind of see four or five moves ahead and say, well, if I do this, then he did that. He'll probably do something like that. So I need to have something that'll counter that. And then he'll think this happened. So I'll need to plan for that. And, uh, so yeah, well, well described by wild Bo. And then we come to the point, the the part where uh, he offers his services to the protectorate under the condition that he permanently get to join her team. Yeah. He was calling her puppy for the longest time as, a, <laughs> as just kind of something to needle her with. And then toward the end of the uh, in the, the toward the end of the interlude, I do like that this shows the the progression where one gets the idea, the impression that they become friends. Oh yeah, I think they definitely became friends. And then uh, pup, puppy becomes a term of endearment. 
Right. And, you know, it, it's kind of like Madcap uh, is a little bit of a parallel to Skitter. You know, somebody who is a villain, but not evil. Not sworn you know, to the cause. Who, yeah. Somebody who got into a thing, found they they were able to make a name for themselves, carve out a niche, and be able to have a career. Uh, but they're they're a mercenary, you know, they're mm-hmm. they're doing it for the pay. They're not they're not out to overthrow the protectorate or rain down a century of darkness or whatever. And so, and since he's, you know, it seems like his skill is mainly strategy and planning. He's probably realizing at some point he's going to get caught. So Mm -hmm. he's got an exit strategy, you know, well, what it'll be. It's like, Oh, well, I'll just switch sides. I want to be a good guy anyway, you know, or the pay is just as good. (laughs) (laughs) And I don't end up in a birdcage. Exactly. As part of her, uh, effort to become a cape we don't want to uh her agreement with cauldron we don't want to let slip the uh the favors that she's been tasked to do um in order to help get her power to get her the power that she needed to deal with madcap um she came to this agreement in addition to the money hey the doctor offered, look, um, you do three favors for us, unspecified favors at a later time, and that will help us uh, help you afford a greater power and put you in a better position to to deal with Madcap. Um, mm. The first one was to uh, to join the protectorate, to join the wards and then the protectorate. The second one was to deliver a package. And what did you think of that final one? Um, it was shocking, but in light of everything, it it makes sense. So in order for the market for power in a vial to continue, you need to make sure that there's kind of a detente, that there's a balance between good and evil. And if, if people like the Slaughterhouse Nine get wiped out, eventually the protectorate is going to become far enough superior that people who are interested in parahuman villainy are going to maybe be, well, I don't have a shot. You know, it's, there's, it's not a level playing field. There's, there's too many of them, not enough of us. So uh, in the sense of a business uh, cauldron as a business, it makes sense to them to try to maintain that balance of power Mm -hmm. and make sure that the, the bad guys balance out the good guys so that, Whoever wants powers for good or evil, when they come to the cauldron, they'll feel like they can, you know, join the parahuman ecosystem and superpower arms dealers, so to speak. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, cauldron's last, uh, favor to, to battery is, um, Siberian and Shatterbird are to escape Brockton Bay and our business with you will be done. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's uh how's that gonna play out? Uh because Jamie had hoped earlier on we, when we were in her brain inside her head, she was uh hoping that if they if Cauldron did ask her to do something illegal or untoward, that she would have put enough good in the world as it were, as a hero, to overcome that. Uh this is gonna be a pretty heavy lift to meet that, wouldn't you say? Oh, definitely. But you know, she kind of has madcap on her side, even though he's called assault now. So mm-hmm. that was his gig was help people escape. Uh, so I think that will help, but he's also a master strategist. So, you know, he should be able to kind of double deal, if you will, be able oh, to you set think them up that, to escape. Uh, you but, think that she would bring uh, assault in on this? I don't see how it can happen otherwise. I mean, that was his whole shtick was because it, it's implying that they are going to get cornered and captured somehow and then sent to the birdcage. And and you're going to need the madcap skills to, to prevent that from happening. But then he should be able to strategize a way to, in the old cheesy spy movies, put a tracking device on them <laughs> so that yeah. they can be recaptured later. Okay. 
Okay. Let's see <laughs> if that stands. And that uh, that brings us to the end of Arc 12. Uh, what were your overall impressions of this one there, buddy? Well, I got to say, I was pretty, pretty brain wiped and overstressed after the whole mannequin battle. Uh, you know, and I'm still in some ways scratching my head that Skidder's still alive. <laughs> but yeah, great writing again. Lots of interesting twists in this one where, you know, like we touched on one minute, you're like, oh, crap, it's the merchant. So then you find yourself kind of sort of cheering for the slaughterhouse <laughs> nine. And, and then you're you're reading about somebody buying a powers from, oh, and cool, we find out more about Cauldron. And then it, it turns out to be this whole neat little side story, you know, where it's mm -hmm. like the former former antagonists are now together and... And then, uh, yeah, that last shoe falls and it's like, oh, you've got to let the ultimate bad people escape. And we get to wait to see how that plays out. Lots of twists and turns. Lots of twists and Definitely. turns. Definitely. Yep. And now it's time for Andy to announce his choice for key character of the arc. Whether hero or villain, cape or civilian, Andy will identify the character that stood out to him, whether it's for good or ill. Andy, who's your selection and why? This was a tough one. There's a lot of different things going on in this one. And I don't think he had a name, but I think he was just kind of the bearded guy who grabbed the chain in the mannequin fight. But I got to mm -hmm. go with the guy who, who helped Skitter, uh, the guy that I would never be able to do what he did. <laughs> I mean, it's one thing for a parahuman, somebody with skills, somebody who is signed up to do stuff to to step up and everything but for somebody just a rando person out of the crowd to stand step up like that and jump in that was that was pretty pretty heroic in the the true sense of heroism so i gotta go with the, bushy the bearded beard guy, guy from the warehouse yeah bushy beard guy all right sounds good the uh, bushy beard guy is a key character of the arc for arc 12 and uh that's it for for arc 12 folks um this one's in the books we want to say thanks again for the questions and comments as always we hope you'll join us for part one of our arc 13 review but for now we want to wish you a merry christmas a happy hanukkah and a happy new year and until next time take care Thanks, everybody. It's been great doing this uh, in 2022, and we look forward to continuing next year, continuing to improve the podcast, and keep all those great questions coming. They really add a nice aspect to this whole effort. Thanks for joining us in this video. We hope you'll like, comment, and subscribe. If not, thanks for stopping by anyway, and we hope you'll return. Music is by the band Why Why Not? from their self-titled debut CD. You can find more information in the link down below. Catch you later.